Hello and welcome to Talk Wildlife. What you've just been listening to are a series of small mammals, uh, the calls that have been recorded as part of a new piece of research uh, that's been done by Stuart Newson from the BTO, who I'm delighted to welcome today. Hiya Stuart, how are you? Oh yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, very good, thank you. No problem. So, you know, I, we, we'll come on to the research in a minute. I, the sounds themselves are absolutely amazing. Um, I've listened to quite a few of them and I will play those again later on in the interview. Um, absolutely amazing calls. But before we actually come onto the methodology as to how you've managed to do that, let's just set the scene and talk a little bit about the small mammals that we're talking about here. So you're talking in general about mice, voles, shrews, rats, door mice. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so, right. So, let, let's just set the scene then. So how many how many species in that group? So, you know, how many species of voles, rats that we're we talking about? Um, I think in total, and I'm sure someone will pick me up that I haven't got it correct. I think in the whole of the UK is about 16 small mammal species. So as you say, this covers the rats, uh, mice, voles, dormice and shrews. Um, some of those only occur on um, islands. So you've got species like the, the Orkney vole, you've got uh, lesser white tooth shrew, which occurs in the Channel Isles and the Scilly Isles. You've got a uh, greater white tooth shrew, continental species, which has been introduced to Ireland, Republic of Ireland, and is spreading, uh, spreading in Ireland. So, um, and you've also got some non-native species that have been here uh, for some time, like uh, edible dormice. So it's quite quite a diversity. Some are some are rare, declining. Some are really common, and uh, you're probably very close to some now, wherever you wherever you are, like brown yes. rats. I often say that to people, and it freaks them out. But <laughs> um, that I mean that that's quite a high number. I think people will be quite surprised because you know they, they you know they're everything. Yeah, we, we we've got a rat and we've we've got a mouse, and oh yeah, everybody knows about a water ball. Um, but that's that's quite a sort of high number of species. But I suppose they, they're quite difficult to record visually because they are quite secretive. Yeah, I think um, I think generally, um, or on the whole, you have to you have to catch them. So you have to use um, like invasive trapping methods. Uh, quite often, longworth traps are used where. Um, they go into um, it's like a, a, a trap they go into and you can you can then check the trap later um, but um, obviously kind of thinking about if you can identify them from the noises they make then that offers a new opportunity where you haven't got to catch them um, so this is what really got me interested in this this whole area yeah yeah and, and what we'll do is we'll talk in detail about that in a minute um, so with regards to recording, how common are we talking? I mean, you've just said that, you know, you're probably quite close to some now. So let's take the average garden in an urban area. Um, what type of species might be passing through somebody's garden? Um, so I think, as you say, a lot of people will have um, brown rat. Um, I think a lot of people, even if you don't know they're there, will often have wood mice, even in quite built up areas. Um, actually house mice uh, seem to be quite scarce. Um, they used to be a lot more common. And uh, I know certainly in Norfolk, um, there's actually very few records a year now of house mice compared right. with wood mice. Um, and then you've got uh, bank voles, which uh, you quite often get in gardens, particularly if you're uh, on the edge of a town or in more kind of rural areas, field voles like kind of longer grass. Um, and then shrews, common shrews are quite quite common. You might you might get them in your garden. But um, I kind of feel it's a bit of a, a bit like bats, which are another interest of mine. It's a bit bit kind of hidden, hidden world. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people see birds in their garden. They're really obvious, particularly if you feed them. But there's this other kind of hidden world, particularly as a lot of these things come out at night and are more kind of active at night. Um, and it's this kind of hidden world that really interests me. Yeah, and, and because they, they are quite difficult to record, how much do we know about that sort of, you know, how well they're doing, you know? So for instance, you know, you mentioned the brown rat. I had a brown rat in my garden 
a few weeks ago. Um, just how sort of common or rare are some of these species? So there has been some really good work. There's a review of British mammals which looked at all the records and tried to produce information on what are different species doing? Are they increasing? Are they declining? Um, I think for a lot of the small mammal species, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of unknowns in really kind of basic information. Are the populations increasing? Uh, how many are there? Particularly for the, the really common things um, like brown rat, trying to work out an estimate of how many individuals there are is really difficult. Um, and then you've got species of conservation interests like um, hazel door mice and harvest mice. Um, so if you're very lucky, you might get those in your garden, but uh, I, I certainly don't, unfortunately. I wish. <laughs> yeah. I, wish. Um, <laughs> I get, right, I get okay. water bowls though. <laughs> water bowls? Yeah, in my garden. We've got a stream running. running. Yeah. Or, or along the stream, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm coming and, to camp out in your garden for a while. Okay. <laughs> uh, so with regards, let's let's just, uh, I'm, I am definitely coming to your research now, but I've got to ask about rats, right? Um, I do freak people out when I say, yeah, you're probably sort of very close to a rat right now, wherever you are. Yeah. Just put that into context for us. So number one, is it true? I mean, I believe it's true, but is it true? You know, are you, if you're sitting in your front lounge, are you relatively close to a rat? Are they that common? Um, they're certainly very common. I don't know, uh, like you hear, you hear that a lot, that you're within yeah. a certain distance of brown rats, but I don't know the original research that underlies that. So yeah. um, I think where I am, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm probably close to a rat now uh because we do we do have brown rats here which has uh, has kind of pros and cons it's been really good for helping to get recordings of brown rats locally um although i don't really want them in my house of course well this is it and you know i, I we do occasionally have them in the garden because i feed the birds so obviously you're going to get a rat because they're opportunists um yeah. I think if they stay at the back of the garden, I can just about get away with it with my wife. I think if they started coming any closer, then I'd have an issue. Yeah. So, okay. so moving on to the research, let's let's just set the scene. You have for some years run the um, a bat survey in Norfolk, and I know because I've taken part in it that you know you you sort of recording bats by sound and then you started hearing bush crickets is that how this came about did you purposely go out and say let's go out and record mammal sounds or did you come across it because of the bat survey like you did with the bush crickets so um for quite a long time i've had a um a real interest in bats and in particular the sound identification so i think it's about maybe eight, nine years, perhaps even longer, I started working on software, so tools to identify calls, uh, identify bats from their calls. And what I found was uh, you put a bat detector out, but you do record other stuff as bycatch. Um, so the first things, bush crickets are really obvious because you get a bush cricket on your, close to your detector and it will just continue for half the night. So you could end up with hundreds of recordings and a lot of bat workers really hate bush crickets. So they just fill up your memory cards with bush cricket recordings. Um, small mammals are a little bit different in that you don't generate large volumes of calls as you do with bats. And I think for this reason, um, I imagine that a lot of bat workers who are doing collecting recordings probably don't realize that small mammals are also recorded. They're kind of just hidden within your recordings. So if you're collecting thousands, thousands of recordings, um, it's very easy not to see like one or two or kind of small numbers of recordings, which are small mammals amongst so that. So did you, once I knew that, yeah. Yeah, so is, is that how you could, did, did you purposely set out to go, right, no, this year I am going to do small mammals, or did you start hearing small mammals in the bat recordings and think, ah, now there's a project we could be looking at? Yeah, I thought, so probably going back four years ago, 
I, I kind of thought, we've got to crack this. I can see variation in these calls, but there's hardly anything written, actually nothing written on the on the calls of most of these species. So it was like, um, like working on bats and going back 30 years and having like no knowledge. Yeah. Um, but I kind of thought, have to crack this. And um, I was very lucky there's that, well, very lucky to work with two people. One, a guy, Neil Middleton, who's up in Scotland. And he approached me because I'd posted something, a recording of a rat. And he was planning on writing a, I wonder if I've got it here. Uh, yeah. So he, sorry for disappearing. Um, so he was starting to work on a book called, Is That a Bat? Right. And um, so we got in touch and we realized that we were both thinking about other stuff that could be recorded on a bat detector. And um, so we started to work, work together on this other project whilst he was working on the book. And then um, someone else, Huma Pierce, was very interested in small mammals. And again, um, I've been working with her collecting uh, recordings of captive individuals. Um, so yeah, it's all come come together really well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because that that was going to be my next question, and you sort of started to answer it there. Okay. How do you if if you it's a new science for want of a better phrase? How do you define the difference between the calls? So how do you go right? Okay, so I'm listening to that call. And I know that call is such and such. So how do you how do you go about doing that? How do, how do you approach that? Okay, so this is really kind of learning from my experience of building classifiers, so software for identifying bats. Uh, what's really important is you build a call library where you can be really confident that those calls are from whatever species you're interested in, but you need a lot of recordings to cover the, the range of variation of calls that that's a single species might produce. So uh, a particular age and sex might produce a range of calls, but then different ages can produce different calls, uh, different situations. So they're using the calls for a whole load of different things that we very poorly understand. Some might be interactions, some might be um, kind of young adult communication, a whole load of reasons. and um, so to kind of understand that, we needed to try and record as many individuals as possible, many different ages, sexes, different situations, <coughs> to ensure that we could understand this range of variation of calls of each species. So we started about, I guess, about two years ago now, uh, kind of working on this and building, building calls, building this kind of call library. Right, okay, so let, let's just... Just step back. With regards to recording, now I, I know because I've, I've done some back recording for the survey. Um, could you just explain for people how you go about recording, say for instance, bats that then obviously has this, the recording of the small mammals as a secondary thing. What, what's the methodology behind it? How, how do you go about doing it? So I think a lot, a lot of my work focused on what we call static detectors, and these are quite clever devices. They're used by uh, a lot of bat workers, and they're left outside to automatically trigger and record as a bat flies over. Um, so above a certain frequency, it'll start recording. It will capture that the sound that the bat's recording or the the small mammals recording, and save it to a little SD card. So um, it's great in terms of you can spend a few minutes and collect a large amount of data for like across a night or multiple nights quite easily doing that. Right. And then so that data is recorded, it then comes back to you and you analyze the data for bats and bush crickets and now the small mammals. Yeah. yeah. So when you get that, this might sound like a daft question. But are you, because you get your card from your recording, um, yeah. does it show up as a sort of sound wave or does it actually show up as a call, if that makes sense? Okay. You know, are you hearing so, it as a call or are you seeing it as a sound wave when you first start looking at the data? 
uh, so I see it as a, what's known as a spectrogram, yeah. which is um, like a, it's an image of um, the sound in relation to time. So, um, so you've got time on one kind of axis and you've got frequency in terms of how high the sound is. Yeah. So our kind of hearing is up to about well, probably less than 20 kilohertz. A lot of the speak small mammal species are producing calls above our hearing into what's known as the ultrasonic and bats again a lot of the calls are above our hearing right okay so you get it in you do your an analysis and you said you built a library of calls and you mentioned captives is that how you go about doing it do, do you go right okay well what we need to do is we need to go out and we need to do recordings of a number of captive species. I mean, a number of species, because all, all your mice fold yeah. Um, Is that what comes first? You have to build that library up and then match it against it? Yeah, you do. Um, and I think I think the first thing to do, um, if, if you just put a bat detector out and leave it out, um, you can't be absolutely sure, even if you've got, say, brown rats in your garden, you can't be sure that that individual call was produced by a brown rat. So what we've done to be sure that we, we're definitely recording our target species, um, we've taken a couple of approaches. So we've worked at a number of captive collections. So I think about four or five big captive collections like the, the British Wildlife Centre, who've got captive uh, like hazel dormice and various species. Um, so all three of us working on this have done this in different parts of the country. Uh, on top of that, um, I've spent a long time live trapping animals locally. And uh, next door, I've got a, what I call my recording studio, all right. where um, we've got small mammal terrariums um, for housing small mammals for a short period of time for a night. Um, and uh, in the same way we'd put a bat detector out, we've got microphones recording them. Um, so for, for things like shrews, that required a, an individual license that I got from Natural England uh, for me to have permission to, to hold, hold shrews for a period to get, get, the, get the recordings. And then it's just trying to collect as many recordings as possible from each, from each individual, different individuals, different situations. And that's, that's just the start. You start to build software and then you collect more recordings and you see how well does my, how well can I tell Pygmy and Common Shrew apart? And you start to realize that um, you're missing particular call types, perhaps particular uh, frequencies. So I see it's a bit like a, um, a complicated jigsaw where the recordings, your sound recordings, are the pieces of the puzzle. And but from the start, you don't know what that jigsaw looks like. You don't know what the picture looks like. Yeah. Uh, if you've got very few bits of the puzzle, you've got no idea. As you collect more information, you start to see what types of call are more common. Um, and then you can be completely thrown that um, that species can produce a different type of call that you haven't seen before. Um, so it's kind of an iterative process to continue to build in recordings until you get to the point where you're collecting more recordings of the species uh, and it's always identifying them correctly or majority of the time it's saying that is definitely always a common shrew and not a pygmy shrew. So yeah, it's kind of time consuming, but it's quite addictive and quite good fun to do. It sounds it. It sounds it. So of the species that we mentioned, you know, of the family, so, you know, mice and voles, etc. Uh, you mentioned a number up front. Have you, have you covered all of those species now, or are you still got gaps that you need to fill with regards to different species? Um, so we've covered all the, all the mainland species now. Um, so all the species present in mainland Great Britain. What we're still working on uh, is um, things like Orkney Shrew, so Huma Pierce, who's one of my one of my collaborators, she's got detectors out in Orkney at the moment, and someone's helping us do very similar process of catching Orkney shrew and trying to get recordings. Uh, I've got a project next year in Guernsey, uh, actually on bats, uh, 
at, but we hope to um, try and get recordings of lesser white tooth shrew and um, hopefully more greater white tooth shrew. Um, so yeah, there's kind of some gaps, but at the same time, I'm looking, because I've been working on European classifiers for bats, but automatically identifying bats kind of more widely in Europe, um, I'm starting to work, think, okay, how can I collect recordings for some of these other European species that we don't have in the UK and trying to kind of, kind of build on what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this might take me the rest of my life. I might have to come back in 20 years to, to give you an update. But, All uh, right, well, I, I don't know whether I'll be around to talk to you then, but anyway, we'll try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just, I'm going to play a few calls now. Um, I'm going to play the, the wood mouse, the brown rat, and the common shrew. And when we come back, what we'll do is we'll just talk about those calls. Um, because I've got a few questions about sort of, you know, how small mammals are communicating. Okay, brilliant. So the, the first thing that strikes me from those calls is just sort of, you know, how varied they are. And at the end of the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the pygmy shrew, which is actually my favourite, um, because it, it's just outstanding for the, such a small thing to be making. All right, I know, you know, it's, it, it's not a loud noise, because clearly we can't hear what, what you're playing on there, but it's an amazing noise, and we'll play that towards the end. Actually, that brings me to a question. I'm going to, I'm going to move on to sort of the sort of types of calls in a minute. Um, of the calls that I've listened to, that you, you've put there, how many of them can you actually just hear? You know, if, if I was walking, I mean, not me, because I'm getting old and I'm a little bit deaf, not well. Um, if I was walking out in the fields and on a night, how many of them calls are actually audible to human sort of ears? So I think of all the species we've looked at, the lowest frequency calls uh, shown there are other shrews. So you can be walking and you might hear this kind of high pitched, you, you must have kind of heard this kind of high pitched kind of shrew noise. Um, all the others are not, um, but in, in our work, we've focused on the high frequency calls. They do produce um, a load of other lower frequency calls, uh, which we've done less work on. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, and what I played there was um, you've sort of got some marked as typical call. So they, they must clearly, I presume, be the most frequent calls that you're hearing from those species. But there are on the on the BTO site there are a range of calls for different species. Are they using calls? You, you did sort of touch on it a little bit earlier on, but are they using calls like, for instance, a larger mammal or a bird would use them? I suppose they are, but you know, are they, are they using them as sort of contact calls, alarm calls? You know, are they using them as territorial calls? Have you been able to look at that and say, actually, yeah, that must be a territorial call, that's a contact call? Have you been able to pick, build up a picture of their communicating? So I, I think. Um... There's very, 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 very little known about the, the role of different calls, understanding what they mean. There's certainly a whole variety of calls, some more common than others. For some of the calls, we've got an idea what they might, might relate to. 
So for the, the shrews, um, they tend to give that um, completely mad call when they come into contact with each other. So it's uh, uh, probably an argumentative interaction that's going on there. Um, but yeah, for other, other calls, there's distress calls. So I think of all the species we've looked at, probably um, house mice and brown rats are probably the two most species which are most well understood. There's been uh, a reasonable amount of behavioral work on calls for those. A lot of the other species, there's very little or nothing, nothing written on them. Species like water vole, there's no, nothing in the literature at all. Right, you are going to be busy. I think you, I can see a book coming on anyway. <laughs> so okay. well, that, yeah. that's the research. So we know how you've gone about doing it. We know the species that you've targeted. Uh, we know the species that you've been able to sort of identify and identify different core ranges from those species. Um, but obviously, you know, you've not just done this on a whim and thought, oh, I could do with having a recording on my computer of, of a wood mouse or a, of a hazel dormouse or whatever. Um, this clearly has a, a massive benefit to how we research and how we conserve um, small mammals, for instance. So how can this, this be used? You know, how can you say to ecologists and conservation, right, this is how we can use it? Okay, I think, I think an important thing to say is the, the call rate of small mammals isn't that high, so compared with bats. So if you're deliberately looking to try and record small mammals, you're not gonna get fast, like thousands and thousands of recordings. But I think there's a real opportunity uh, where people are putting out bat detectors, static bat detectors. Um, they're collecting across the country, people would be collecting huge volumes of bat recordings and within those recordings, there'll be quite a lot of uh, small mammal calls uh, recorded as bycatch. I think probably on the whole, unknowingly by, by the bat workers who are using them, there's these, this kind of other information in there. Um, this from a start can be really useful in generating like, information on species presence. So if you're doing, uh, let's say a lot of work in woodland in the Southwest, um, hazel dormice are quite vocal and they produce loud calls. So if they're present in a wood, you've got a chance of picking them up on a bat detector. And if you could automatically identify them as you can with uh, from the work that we've been doing, you can start to provide additional information for some of these species. Um, the things like ha harvest, harvest mouse, they produce really distinctive two part calls that are not recorded in any other small mammal species. So again, you get a recording of that, you can be certain you've got harvest mice there. If you don't record them, then you might just not have recorded their calls. So, um, so I think it offers a real opportunity. And the same for um, things like uh, detecting brown rats on seabird islands. It offers another opportunity, or black rats or house mice. It offers another opportunity to leave out equipment to potentially record um, like the sounds of um, like seabirds, uh, like arrival, getting information of those at the same time, collecting information for, for brown rats. And I think even if you're in a really loud, noisy seabird colony, because of the calls of brown rats are a bit higher above the frequency of birds, you'll still kind of be able to pick them out in a really kind of noisy, noisy kind of seabird colony, and colony environment. So, I kind of see there's kind of real opportunities for conservation. Um, I think at the same time, we're right at the start of that. And I think for many people, acoustics, um, whilst they've been used for many years for bats, are really not on the, the radar for, for a lot of mammal folk to use as a, as a survey method. So um, but hopefully by highlighting this and showing what can be done, we can start to get more people thinking about it and more people thinking about the range of variation in calls in other parts of Europe or in other parts of the world. Um, so yeah, it's, it's yeah, really a lot of potential. Other parts, that, sorry. Yeah, definitely a lot of potential. Yeah, yeah. No, it's funny you should mention other parts of the world because while you were talking, I was thinking, I, you know, obviously the, there's, there's quite a few sort of projects for uh, rapid eradication from islands and in particular, 
Um, New Zealand carries out quite a few. Um, yeah. And I suppose this could be ex extremely useful both to do so beforehand to record because you, you'd be able to work out and map the density. So where, where are the rats actually gathering so that you could concentrate your efforts more? Um, but also then to do follow up recording to find out whether it's been a success and whether you've actually, you know, eradicated the rats from those islands. So from that point of view, it sounds like an amazing sort of step in, in, in assisting that kind of um, operation. Yeah, I kind of imagine that it will create a lot of opportunities. I imagine there could be a lot of papers in the future looking at things like relating call rate to density of things like rats and trying to kind of get more understanding of how how these things kind of relate to each other. Um, but I have got have got a project in Tasmania at the moment. So I'm advising on um, development of a few citizen science projects out there. Um, and one of those is starting to build classifiers for to, to identify bats. Um, but obviously we're finding small mammal recordings as well. And I'm starting to see um like brown rats in the recordings because they've got a lot of the species that we've very kindly kindly given them in the past like brown rats and black rats and house mice and things um yeah it's definitely a lot of opportunities yeah and and again while you were talking there my, my mind's sort of running into overdrive now so there's on the one hand you can sort of work out sort of all right there's rats on this island we need to get rid of them but yeah. if you were doing a similar thing, so say, for instance, you were saying, right, OK, well, we need to do some research. And you, you touched on it here with, wood, you know, in the woodlands with sort of door mice and things like that. But I suppose you could take that to somewhere like New Zealand and say, right, OK, well, some of the smaller marsupials, let's map some of their recordings, some of their audio so that we can then do some recording in areas where you think there might be, but you don't know to what numbers, let's go and put some recording out there. So it could actually contribute to the actual counting for want of a better phrase of, you know, knowing how many of that individual species there are in a particular area. So it, it has a lot of conservation, um, you know, it can be applied to a lot of conservation type projects from my point of view. Yeah, I think particularly at the moment, there's some really exciting analytical work looking at um, arrays of microphones, having so basically more than one microphone. And by having this, you can start to look at movements of things that are making noise like bats or um, but also you could start to it opens up uh, a lot more opportunities for producing estimates of density. Uh, if you can get density, then you could scale it up to get population estimates. So there's a whole kind of acoustic field of estimating population size that's really developing there. And I think that static detectors, so this type of a device that you leave outside to automatically record has a lot of potential to, to kind of improve our understanding of some of these species. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, certainly when I saw, I, I haven't received, because I know the paper's actually published in, um, British Wildlife Magazine this month, and mine hasn't fallen onto my doorstep yet, annoyingly, um, <laughs> but I can't wait to read it. And, you know, when I saw sort of the information come out uh, from the BTO, I thought, oh, yeah, we've got to talk about that because it's, it's, it's really interesting. So congratulations on it because it's it's an amazing piece. Um, and, uh, you know, it'd be great to see how it's going to progress in the future. So where do you see yourself taking it? Now, you started off with bats and then you went into bush crickets and now you've gone into small mammals. What's next, or isn't there anything? What What else do you think? Well, hang on, yeah, we we could we could actually sort of take this application and apply it to this set of animals in the future. So I certainly think those groups I'm working on, um, I'm trying to extend it, trying to improve what I've done, but also extend it more widely in Europe. Um, but there are other species groups that are also recorded. So I've done a little bit of work on this, but some species of moth produce high frequency sound. Wow. So um, at the moment, my, my classifiers only include two species of moth, um, but there are, there are other species that produce high frequency sound. So I think it was only discovered a few years ago. Um, I, saw this, I saw this paper in, I think it was in Nature, where guys at Bristol had been working on um, a micro moth um, I think it's 
probably get this wrong. Um, Spindlermin moth. You, you know your moths. It's a yeah. little kind of white and black uh, micro moth. And um, before it was known that some macro moths produce high frequency sound, but not, um, not micros. And even though this species is completely deaf, so it can't hear the sound it's producing, every time it flies, it gives out this high frequency sound continuously uh, to try and deter bats. So just kind of blasting out this sound. So this is one species that I worked on last year. I came across uh, some caterpillars of this, this species. I bred them up, I got recordings, um, a lot of recordings, I built them into my classifier. So now anytime that species of moth is recorded, um, we, we can identify it. There's also, um, like I know you're a moth guy, uh, green silver lines. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Is that right? Really? So again, that's another one which produces really distinctive calls at high frequency. So way above our hearing about 30 kilohertz. And again, this is another species I've collected recordings, built them in and can identify. But again, there's a lot of unknowns. I don't know at the moment what other species produce high frequency sound. I know not all moths do, um, but yeah, it'd be good to develop that. Not, not that I think anyone's particularly as a kind of a real like need for this or application because it's much easier to, to do moth trapping, but just because it's a, uh, feel we can do it so you might as well um, yeah i mean it's just because you know there's there's so much we know about nature and wildlife there's you yeah. know we know tons but there's so much we don't know and yeah. you know i mean i didn't know that and, and you obviously you know death death said hawk moth makes an audible sound you can actually hear that yeah. um but i didn't know one of my favorite moths and you know i have done a, a you know how to do mothing uh, video on top wildlife yeah. and there is actually a picture of a green symbol silver lines on there because it is one of my okay. absolute favorites the first time i saw it okay. i just was absolutely blown away it's an absolute yeah. sweet and now to know that it actually makes a noise as well i mean what whatever yeah. it's just no, brilliant I'll, yeah no i'll have to send you some sound recordings because they are they yeah. are quite amazing that'd be amazing um, yeah to hear them i think the other group i've done some work on uh is bumblebees so i've spent I guess I started about just over a year ago, just recording bumblebees. And I'm, I'm okay at identifying some of the really common species. But what I quick, quickly realized is there's quite, there's quite big differences uh, between different species in, the, in the, the kind of the frequency of the buzzing of different species. There's differences between casts. So generally bigger, bigger bees like queens will produce lower frequency calls. Um, but I think there's a huge amount of potential to identify uh, leave out devices again and collect data for bumblebees. Um, I think that's kind of lower down on my list if I had a um, huge amount of time. Um, but I think the other thing on small mammals, I uh, early on, it, it's been really difficult to get any, any interest to try and try and work on it. I think people haven't realized the potential um, so I'm really hoping that uh, now people see this, they'll start to kind of explore this idea a bit more. Well, I for one think there's massive potential, um, but then who am I? Um, but I think there's massive potential. I, you know, just having read the small amount I've read, you think, yeah, this could be used in so many different ways. Um, so congratulations on it, because it's an amazing piece. As I say, I can't wait to read it in, should arrive today, hopefully. <laughs> I'll keep watching yeah, out for the postman. He's... <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> well, yeah, send, I'll send you a copy. Yeah, I, I haven't today. got a copy. Sorry? I, I haven't got my copy, but I'll send I'll send you a PDF if you if you like. So, oh, yeah, cheers, yeah. Because, I mean, it, it, it is due. I know it's due, but yeah. it's just not arrived yet. Um, so, yeah, thanks for your time. Um, congratulations on the piece of work and to your colleagues that worked with you because, you know, I think, you know, it... it to me, it's it, it's quite groundbreaking. I think you know it's it's got a lot of potential for the future, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing where you go next. I'm looking forward to a full catalogue of the 2,600 and odd species of moth in this country by vocalisation. So if you if you'd like to help, <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, yeah, well, we you could go with lace yeah. wings and and carries. 
I, you, you could go on forever. But Stuart, thanks ever so much for your time. That that was it was really thank you for exciting. Inviting me. It's, it's a great project. Okay, thank you, thank you for inviting and me. I Cheers. promised people I was going to end off with the pygmy shrew, and I am. Yeah. But I'll start off with a warning. If you've got sensitive ears, turn it down a bit. <laughs> and thanks very much, Stuart. Talk to you soon. Take okay. care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.